now have the keynote uh, speaker um, session uh, titled Towards Faster Cleaner Growth. Um, I invite the moderator for this session, Dr. Hemandas Lohano. He is a professor of um, uh, economics at IBA. Uh, please, Dr. Hemandas, if you can please join us on the stage. Uh, we have with us uh, our speaker, Dr. Francisca Onsorg. Uh, I invite you also to please join us. Good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, we are so honored to have Dr. Francisca for this keynote speech for this conference. Let me briefly introduce Dr. Francisca. She is Chief Economist of South Asia region in the World Bank and uh, uh, she leads actually a research program um, on the key economic issues in South Asia to inform policy debate and uh, World Bank lending. Uh, before taking this position, uh, she spearheaded the World Bank's flagship report. Actually, this flagship report is called Global Economic Prospects. So it's a global level development report published uh, semi-annually. So uh, she actually edited and published uh, these reports, uh, almost 20 reports. And uh, she, so it means that she has a broader view of uh, world level. And uh, um, so, but at this moment, she is actually uh, a leading chief economist at South Asia region. So South Asia also publishes, uh, so World Bank actually publishes South Asia region, which is South Asia update report. And at the country level, we have also Pakistan development update, South Asia development update. So she is also publishing and leading that report as well. Uh, so before joining World Bank, she was working with IMF, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Uh, her research has been published in very famous journals and has been cited in numerous uh, famous um, uh, publications such as uh, Wall Street Journal, The Economist, Financial Times. She holds PhD uh, from the University of Toronto. So very warm welcome to this uh, keynote speech, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if you would like to start your presentation here, oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, you, thank you very much for the organizers. Thank you, Asma, for inviting me. It's really a joy to be here. In this very aptly named conference, Challenging Linearity, you may have heard of the World Bank's Reforms for Brighter P Future campaign. This is what it's about, about a structural break, a break with the past, a new path. And let me just give you, as Dr. Zaidi very nicely, eloquently told us that we can learn from others. We might not be able to copy other countries, but we can learn from other countries. And this is, in this spirit, let me just give you a couple of statistics to motivate the Reforms for Brighter Future campaign that the World Bank is, is currently uh, conducting. Look at per capita income in Pakistan. Over the last 10 years, per capita income in Pakistan rose by 7%. 7% over the whole period. 10 years, 7% increase in per capita income. 7%, Comp compare that with Bangladesh, where it's been 8% every year on average. Yet this is the comparison within the region, not far away. Hence, the need for a brighter future, a path, reforms for a brighter future, hopefully a break with the past. Another statistic to bear in mind, is Lahore and Peshawar among, are among the five most polluted cities in the world with Delhi. <laughs> and that is true even in summer, when the trade winds blow the other, or don't blow so strongly. So even in summer, Lahore and Peshawar are among the, five, among the most polluted cities in the world. Their pollution is higher, about 50% higher than in Delhi, and about double that in Dhaka. That is what the reforms for, bright, for a brighter future try to achieve, a break from this path, a break with the past towards faster, cleaner growth. 
In this goal towards faster, cleaner growth, Pakistan is not alone. This is a, a, an ambition for the whole region. And that's what I want to show you today. Pakistan may be at one extreme end of it, but this is a broader issue that pertains to all of South Asia. And just to give you a bit of a, a guide for the next 30, 40 minutes that I'll be speaking, I'll go through four questions. First, what's the short-term outlook for South Asia? Second, how can South Asia's fiscal risks be addressed? Again, Pakistan is not alone in having fiscal challenges. Other countries in the region have them too. Uh, third, <laughs> what, what can spur investment in energy efficient technologies? Okay, just to go back to the second question, the silver bullet to address fiscal risks is usually growth. Problem is that no one's quite sure how to generate growth. So the third question gives you one of these few win-wins where you can actually get faster and cleaner growth. And I'll go through that. But of course, the energy transition is going to have labor market implications, which matters for many of you who will be looking for jobs in the next few years once you graduate here. And um, I'm looking forward to showing you some of these results, what's awaiting you in the labor market. So let's start with the short-term economic outlook. This is actually not an easy global environment for countries to operate in. This chart, the slide shows you the current global conditions that your Ministry of Finance, your central bank, that they are facing. Globally, manufacturing, the manufacturing sector has been weak for several months now, actually a couple of years now. You can see that in the chart on the left. It shows you a purchasing manager's index. Uh, the blue bar is the manufacturing index, and you can see how it's been struggling below 50, so pretty much in contraction territory, globally. Globally, the manufacturing sector has been suffering. What's been supporting growth has been services. The red line, the chart on the, uh, I guess, left when you look at it. But you see that that is phasing. Even that is now no longer in the expansionary ter uh, territory, is now hitting kind of a neutral territory, that red line. So services, the engine of growth for the, la the global growth, the engine of global growth over the last couple of years is now beginning to fade. Meanwhile, commodity prices, all the countries in the region are heavy importers of commodities. Well, actually most, not all. Um, heavy in uh, importers of commodities, especially oil, oil and gas. Now, oil prices have been rising with the conflict in the Middle East that Dr. Zaidi already alluded to. And that is something that is straining current account balances in a lot of countries, all the oil importers around the world. Not just here, elsewhere too. Finally, financing costs. Financing costs are very high now. The, the, what has happened with global monetary policy rates is something we haven't seen in a generation. You don't see that in the chart here, but just FYI, we showed that in previous, in other charts in the report as well. Global interest rates of the advanced economy central banks, the G7 central banks, have risen as steeply and as high as they haven't since the 1970s. So it's expensive to borrow at the moment. Financing conditions are tight. And you can see the increase in advanced economies in the blue bar here on the right. You can see even more the recent surge in emerging markets that just in the last couple of weeks has been subsiding a little bit. So borrowing is expensive. Financing costs are high. In this background, it's actually quite remarkable how well South Asia has done. You can see that in the chart on the far left. The, the golden diamonds show you growth in South Asia, and the blue bars show you growth in all the other regions. You can see South Asia has been doing better than all the other emerging market regions, and it's expected to continue to do better in 2024, for example. So growth in, uh, in 23 and 24 is around 5.8, 5 5.6%. That is a slowdown from 2022. The global economy really rebounded in 21. In South Asia, it was a little bit dela uh, delayed. It was a big rebound in 2022. Now, there is a normalization in growth, but it's a lesser slowdown in the rest, than in the rest of the world. So compared to the rest of the world, South Asia is actually doing quite well in terms of growth. But, there's always a but, there's always a catch. <laughs> it's not doing as well as it did before the pandemic. 
And that's what you can see in the chart in the center here. So the golden bars are what growth used to be like in the five years before the pandemic. The blue bars, the blue ranges, are what growth is going to be like in each of the South Asian countries over the next couple of years. And you can see that in all of the South Asian countries, growth in the next couple of years is going to be less than before the pandemic. So things are not going to get easier, they're going to be harder than before the pandemic. That's one caveat. The other caveat is not only is growth going to be slower than before the pandemic, growth is also going to be much less than is needed to achieve government's own targets. In fact, most governments in this region, South Asia, have explicit goals to become either high income or in the case of Pakistan, upper middle income countries within a generation. So to somewhere around 2040, 2050. So the chart on the right shows you in the golden diamonds what growth rates, annual average growth rates would be needed for each country to achieve high income status by 2050 or the, the red bars, upper middle income status by 2050. And you can see that for every single country, growth is currently the blue bar. Currently growth is not enough to achieve the government's own targets. For Pakistan, there is a particularly large gap. <laughs> it would take annual average growth, not just a year or two, it would take annual average growth on the order of 7% to get to upper middle income status by 2050. And you can see in a blue bar the current growth rates, the current projected growth rates. So there's a big gap. But that's what reforms for a brighter future is all about. How can we break with the past? and really accelerate growth for a better and brighter future in a way that can actually be sustained and that benefits everyone. Now, this was the baseline, the most likely scenario, but there are a number of risks, a number of things that could go wrong, where growth could turn out much less than expected in the previous slide I showed you. So one risk, and I know Pakistan is one of the countries that have felt it most, is natural disasters. But just to point out, this is not just Pakistan. This region, South Asia, is particularly vulnerable to climate disasters. Most of the South Asian countries rank in the top quartile by Notre Dame's Climate Vulnerability Index. The red bar here on the right shows you that 60 million people on average per year have been affected by climate disasters in the past decade. That's more than in any other emerging market and developing economy region. Climate disasters are a real risk to the outlook in this particular region, and they're more than any other emerging market and developing economy region. The problem with climate disasters is you can't you can't plan for them very well. You will never expect them in your baseline, most likely scenario. You just know that they come. They come regularly and they derail growth. So you need to do a lot of risk management, a lot of what-if scenarios, a lot of policymakers need to constantly think about contingencies. What if the next flood comes? What if the next drought comes? What if? Lots of what if scenarios. That's actually quite a difficult thing to do in policies because it means building buffers and preserving buffers for the time when the disaster comes. The other downside risk is a slowdown in China, steeper than expected slowdown in China. That's you, you see in the chart on the left where we've used Oxford economics model, a very standard macroeconomic model that's used by many of the, the big um, central banks and ministries in the world to model what uh, economic uh, scenarios. This particular scenario assumes that growth in China slows by two and a half percentage points. That's a steep slowdown because of disruptions in the, essentially because of disruptions in the real estate sector. The real estate sector in China is large. It accounts for about a quarter of GDP. So a big slowdown without policy stimulus to offset a slowdown is going to hit growth in China. So in our scenario, we assume that it reduces growth in China by two and a half percentage point in 24, and then policy will kick in and you will have a rebound in China in 2025. That will trickle through the global economy. 
you can see that in emerging markets other than China, it will reduce growth by somewhere between three quarters and a percentage point. South Asia is actually fairly insulated from this shock. The impact on South Asia would be about half the impact on other emerging markets and developing economies, other than China. And the reason is, in good measure, the fact that South Asia has, all the South Asian countries, not just Pakistan, all the South Asian countries have so many restrictions on external transactions. The chart on the left shows you the import and export restrictions that are in place in South Asian countries. The red dotted lines is the emerging market and developing economy average. The blue bar shows you for each of the countries what import and export restrictions there are. On all, all the countries we have uh, data for, import restrictions are above average, above the emerging market and developing economy average. And for India, it's also export restrictions that are above average. That's on the import and export side. We have a similar chart in our report that I'm not showing you here on the capital flows, not just the goods the trade flows, the capital flows. Capital account restrictions are also above average in South Asia, both on inflows and on outflows. And of course, in the foreign currency restrictions, under exchange rate pressures in the last year, a lot of countries have implemented foreign ex in, in the region have implemented foreign exchange restrictions with some unpleasant side effects in some of them. So some of them have now, like Nepal, for example, has complete, almost completely unroll, uh, unbound them again because of all the side effects, unintended side effects. But this region is partly insulated from these global shocks because it has so many restrictions on trade, on capital flows, on foreign exchange transactions. That insulates against global shocks, but it also undermines private investment. And that is something that has been weak around the region. You can see in the chart on the left, private investment growth. Actually, this data is very difficult to come get a hold of on a global basis. So this region should be congratulated for actually having this data. It's not easy to put together a global database, a global data set of glo uh, private investment. So for most of, of the countries in the region, we do actually have private investment data, and it's weak. The blue bars shows you private investment growth, uh, the latest data we could find, depending on the country. The golden diamonds show you what it used to be like before the pandemic. In all the countries in the region, private investment growth is now less than it was before the pandemic. There is pronounced private, and sec uh, private investment weakness. Now, Pakistan stands out, you will see that here you know, on the chart on the left. A very severe contraction, together with Bhutan, Nepal. Now, in some countries, not Pakistan, in some countries in the region, this private investment weakness has been offset by public investment strength. That's especially the case in India and Bangladesh. Governments have been investing heavily, heavily in infrastructure. Not so in Pakistan. So there's been pronounced overall investment weakness in, in Pakistan and private investment weakness around the region that in some countries has been offset by public investment strength. The question now is how long this public investment strength can be sustained, even in countries where it has actually, been, uh, where it has actually happened. And that takes me to the second question, the fiscal challenges across the region. The fiscal challenges can actually be summarized in a slide. High debt, low revenues. This is something that is true virtually around the region. This South Asia is the region with the highest average debt, unweighted average. In the chart you can see here on the left, 86% of GDP is government uh, debt in South Asia on average. Now, admittedly, that is driven up by the Maldives and Sri Lanka. That's the top of that yellow whisker in the South Asia SAR bar on the left. But even Pakistan and India have government debt levels that are well above the emerging market and developing economy average. You can see that average in the, chart, in the left chart, the right bar for EMDE is the red bar. That's about 60% of GDP. 
So all the, almost all the countries in the region have government debt that is well above the emerging market and developing economy average. And it's not just higher, it's also increased much faster than in, the, in other emerging markets. So the difference between the blue bar and the, the red bars in the far chart. And one of the reasons, of course, for this higher debt has been revenue weakness, pronounced revenue weakness, again, across the region. You can see here the revenue ratios, the latest revenue ratios in the chart on the, on the right, the 2022, 2022 averages. The emerging market and developing economy averages about 30% of GDP, 29 point something. You see that almost all the countries in the region have government revenue to GDP ratios that are well, well, well below the emerging market and developing economy average. Bhutan is a bit of an exception because it, uh, it receives a lot of aid. If you took that out, it would be even, le even lower, below the EMDE average. So that revenue re weakness is something that really constrains government policies. Very difficult to provide government services, infrastructure investment, education. It's very difficult for a government that raises only about 10% of GDP in revenues. Very difficult to fund a well-functioning government with that. And one of the, you will see that one of the reforms for a brighter future, one of the emphasized reforms there, is stunting. That is not just about health. That is about public infrastructure. This is about water. This is about sewage system. This is about public infrastructure. Very difficult to fund if government revenues to GDP ratios are 12% of GDP. And it's not going to get much easier as time passes. And that's what I'm trying to show you in the chart on the, in, the, in this slide. It shows you what the global environment is going to be like for governments. Governments will be facing more and more fiscal challenges, because growth momentum will slow and financing costs might ease, but they're not going to go back to anywhere near what it used to be before the pandemic. In the chart on the left here, we calculate potential growth. We actually published a database of potential growth, the underlying fundamental growth that can be sustained over the long run. It's essentially driven by, by productivity, by human capital, by investment. And we'll take this forward at current trends. What would potential growth look like over the next decade, over the 2020s, compared to the 2010s? Just taking current trends in investment, consensus forecast, taking current trends in education, current trends in life expectancy, all these things determine labor force participation, but also productivity. And taking current trends in, uh, in catch-up as well, potential to advance economy, catch-up potential to advance economies. And all these current trends point to a clear slowdown in underlying potential growth, fundamental growth momentum over the remainder of this decade compared to the last decade. In South Asia, about a quarter percentage point. A little bit, there's a little bit more momentum because of better demographics, still a rising working age population growth. In the world as a whole, there's almost half a percentage point lower growth. So it'll become harder and harder to generate growth, generate growth. It'll become harder and harder to generate growth. It really needs a break with the past. The global environment is going to become more difficult, so export-driven growth is going to become more difficult. But also the domestic environment is going to become more difficult as working age population growth begins to plateau. This region, thankfully, still has the demographic dividend. The question is, can it use it? And it really needs a break with the past. It needs reforms to really leverage this momentum. So lower growth means harder for governments to raise revenues, harder for governments to, to, to maintain sound fiscal positions. Financing costs are also, maybe they'll ease, but they will become, will remain much more difficult than they were before the pandemic. And that's what we show here in the chart on the right. It shows you the US federal funds rate, expectations by the Federal Open Market Committee, so essentially the government, governing body of the US Federal Reserve. And it shows you the 2010s average of the federal funds rate. So this is kind of the interest rate that drives global financial, uh, financial conditions. This is uh, <laughs> the proxy for the global risk-free rate, the federal fund rate. The blue bar shows you what ex is expected over the next few years. That rate is going to remain well above the 2010s average. 
So funding government debt or private debt is going to become more expensive than it was before the pandemic. It's going to become harder for governments to run a government and for private sectors also to borrow. Harder and more expensive. Now, how, to, how can these fiscal positions be restored? The silver bullet, I mentioned that already, is growth. The problem with growth is no one really knows how to, how to, sustain, how to generate growth. It's a very difficult thing. To, to generate for the long term. It really takes bold reforms to get a boost in growth. What can also help is uh, debt management. That helps at the margin. But what really helps consolidate or improve fiscal conditions in the end is fiscal consolidation. And many countries have found it helpful to have fiscal rules. Pakistan actually has a fiscal rule to try and constrain fiscal pressures and to maintain sound fiscal positions. Turns out that country, here in the chart on the right, we show what happened to government debt since the pandemic in countries that had strong and weak fiscal rules. The countries that have strong fiscal rules actually had a slower buildup of government debt through the difficult pandemics, where most countries implemented some form of fiscal stimulus. So most, the countries with stronger fiscal rules had a slower buildup of government debt than countries with weaker fiscal rules. Now again, a lot of countries in South Asia actually have a fiscal rule. The problem is, you see in the chart on the left, all the countries that have fiscal rules, Pakistan is one of them, India is another one of them, Maldives, Sri Lanka, they all have fiscal rules. The problem is, <laughs> they're honored in the breach. <laughs> You see the actual fiscal deficit, and you can see the, the, the budget rule. The, these fiscal rules are not very binding in South Asia. In fact, in the chart on the center, you see a broader comparison, not with their own targets and their own outcomes, as we do in the, chart, in the far chart. In the center chart, we compare the strength of the fiscal rule as estimated by the IMF in South Asia versus other emerging markets and developing economies. And you can see that the South Asian fiscal rules are either in the bottom quartile or near the bottom quartile by strength of fiscal rules. And the difficulty with, the, with the, a lot of the fiscal rules here is that they're either in the future, they don't, they're, not currently, they're not set to bind currently, they're set for some goal in the future, or there's no clear enforcement mechanism. So it's very difficult to make these rules really bite. For these rules to bite, you need stronger mechanisms and more automatic mechanisms to have them bite. Now, I, um, we said, we, we talked about growth being the silver bullet to generate, to improve fiscal, bull, fiscal positions. It's very difficult to, it takes bold reforms to really generate growth over the long term. It's, it's not an easy thing to do, but there is one area where the current juncture may actually be an opportunity to generate this growth, to gen generate a new kind of growth, a cleaner kind of growth, a faster kind of growth, and that's the green transition. The green transition is well underway in the global economy. China is actually, at least in terms of jobs in the, in the, and jobs and investment in the green, uh, in green, in the green sector, green growth. China is actually the spearhead, the, the, the leader in it. So it's well underway, and it can be an opportunity to generate growth. And that's what I want to show you here. The, it's not just China that's been progressing. The whole world has improved. You know, the energy efficiency, the, which is the measure we focus on here, energy efficiency has improved around the world, including actually in South Asia as well. That's the red bars in the far, in the far chart. The, it, it measures the change in g energy use, energy consumption per GDP. So a measure of energy efficiency. How much energy does each unit of GDP require? And this region, just like the rest of the world, has improved. There have been improvements in energy efficiency since 2010 over the past decade. The problem is that growth has been so strong that it has overwhelmed these improvements in efficiency and overall energy consumption has gone up. But, and, but even after these efficiency gains, this region, South Asia, continues to have an energy intensity that's about twice the global average. That's what the chart here on the right shows you. If you compare the red bar on the right with the far right blue bar, for every unit of GDP, 
South Asia uses twice as much energy as the global average. And yes, that applies to Pakistan as well. It also applies to India. Bangladesh and Sri Lanka are actually below average. The ones that are above average, above that red bar average, are both Pakistan and India. So there are, in principle, a lot of gains to be made with improvements in energy efficiency. Why are they not happening? And that's what I want to go to, into, or what can make them happen? Maybe that's a better way to phrase it. What can make these improvements in energy efficiency happen? And that's what I want to go to, into for the rest of this, this question three. One reason that this region is fairly energy inefficient is the spread of technologies. Oh, this is the resolution of this is not very good. Anyways, but the, the region is squarely in the middle bracket. There has been a lot of adoption of energy, of, of sort of low-tech energy efficient technologies. LED light bulbs in particular have been very widely disseminated in the region, are widely used in the region. The region is really a leader in basic technology adoption for energy efficiency. What's missing is that right bar here, that right category where the, <laughs> the lights are switched off. The advanced technologies that switch off energy use when it's not necessary, when it's not needed. That's the bit that's missing, the advanced technology adoption. And just to illustrate this in a more technical way, we have done a survey in seven countries, seven emerging markets and developing economies, of about 2,000 firms, uh, well, actually about 3,500 firms in South Asia. Pakistan is actually not in the sample. The sample for South Asia includes India and Bangladesh. So the Saba you see in the chart on the right is, South India, uh, is India and, and uh, Bangladesh. It shows, but it's something, it's a pattern that seems to anecdotally hold across the region. The region, the region's firms, these 4,500 firms in the region, 3,500 firms in the region, have adopted basic technologies like LED light bulbs more than in all the other countries that are included in this particular sample in our uh, technology adoption survey. Three quarters, more than three quarters of firms in South Asia have adopted LED light bulbs. That compares with about half on average in other emerging markets and developing economies. So there's been very good penetration of these very basic technologies for saving energy. What is missing a bit is on the advanced uh, technologies. And one example of those is a programmable th thermostat. There are other examples in our report. But the programmable thermostat basically switches off or switches off the AC when no one's in the room. It switches down the energy consumption when it's not needed. And that's where you see South Asia is lagging other countries. Only 7% of South Asia's firms have adopted, for example, programmable thermostats. That compares with an average in other emerging markets and developing economies of about 12%. So the South Asian firms really lead on these basic technologies. They're kind of lagging on these advanced technologies. There's lots of room to increase take up of these advanced technologies that are widely used in other parts of the world, including other emerging markets and developing economies. The main laggards are actually not the large firms. The large firms are fairly, they're sort of fairly good at energy, advanced energy adoption as well, technology adoption as well. And that's what the chart on the right shows you. It's, a, it's based on a regression where we have, where we have on the left-hand side the technology adoption index on the right hand side, various firm characteristics. And you can see that larger firms, those with 100 plus or even just 90, 20 plus employees are significantly more likely or have a significantly higher technology adoption index. The larger firms do adopt new technologies as they become uh, available. And we will see that again in, in another randomized control trial we see in a minute. The, the firms that are more professionally managed as well, the ones that have better educated managements and the ones that, that use key performance indicators, those also adopt technologies fairly well. The problem is, of course, a long tail of very inefficient informal firms. Now, one reason firms don't adopt technologies is simply that they're not aware of them. 
And this is what I want to show you here in a, in a very interesting randomized control trial we did in Bangladesh for about 560 garment fi uh, firms in the leather industry. What we did is we gave them a new motor to run their sewing machines. And we gave them not just the motor, and that's the important part, we gave them the motor plus the meter to measure energy consumption. So before the experiment started, we asked these firms, what do you think will be your energy savings from this new motor if you meter them? What they expected is here what is called belief about electricity savings from new technologies. They expected about a 30% cut energy savings, 30% lower energy bill. And that, of course, translated then into a willingness to pay that was about one third, one third of what the actual market price of that, sewing, that motor was. So not really willing to pay because they didn't expect much benefit. What actually happened once they metered it was an 80% energy saving. So that's interesting and it's all right, but okay. The much more interesting part of this experiment was actually what happened after they realized the energy saving. Once a few firms had begun metering the energy savings, this news spread. And what we saw is that a lot of firms started taking up this new motor. It didn't take much, just a few firms having a new motor and a new meter to actually measure the impact of this new motor. And this new spread, and we find that a whole range of firms picked up this new technology. Within three months, 10% of firms had already adopted this new technology, even firms that were never told about this experiment, the ones that we call in the control, control firms, control group. So the good news here is that it, a few small, cheap interventions, like a meter and a motor, can spread, if they're convincing, if it's a good technology, that can spread very quickly, very broadly. If there's savings to be had, firms catch on very quickly. And we will come back to this in another good news slide at the end. So one way of stimulating the adoption of more energy efficient technology is to just spread the information. Another way is to have a good grid a good national power grid. As it turns out, in our, um, again, the same uh, survey we did before for these seven countries of the firm technology adoption, we checked, we asked firms, do you use a backup generator? Turns out South Asia is the outlier. Three quarters of South Asian firms use a backup generator. Backup generators are incredibly energy inefficient and super polluting. It's not a good technology. It's really a technology of the past that you want to break with. But why do you use it? Because they can't trust the grid. And that's what we show in the chart on the right. The, about a third of firms had had in the last month a power outage. Of course they're going to use a generator. And then we did a regression. What's the probability that a firm uses its backup in a, a generator if it has a power outage? And of course, I mean, the obvious, you know, if you've had a, prob a power outage in the last month, of course you're more likely to, re significantly more likely to have a backup generator. So one way to improve energy efficient technologies is simply to have a reliable power grid. That requires public investment. And public investment requires sound fiscal positions and it requires the government to, to have the resources to pay for public investment, i.e. The, the revenues. So I've already given you two types of policies that can improve the energy efficiency, that can give you productivity gains through energy savings. One was uh, information, another one was a, reliant, a reliable power grid. Another set of policies is about getting incentives right. And that's what the, ch the chart on the far side here shows you. It's our estimate of the total carbon price. Basically, it compares the local carbon price of various carbon products against global prices. And you can see that in large parts of the region, carbon is actually negatively priced. It makes perfect sense to use carbon-intensive fuels and carbon-intensive energy because you get a subsidy. No, everyone should be, I mean, it's just economics incentives. No, it, ma it makes perfect sense to head towards the most polluting, most carbon intensive energy because it's got a negative price. 
So one way for policymakers to encourage energy efficiency, uh, energy efficient technology adoption, is of course to make the price of carbon not so negative. No? And uh, there we're back to subsidy reform. There are other reforms too that can achieve something like that. And that's what we looked at in the chart on the right. We save you a lot of time. We surveyed the whole literature we could find on every single study we could find in the academic lit literature and the policy literature too, the World Bank, IMF, ADB kind of literature. Everything we could find on the impact of policy experiments on energy efficient technology adoption. And this is summarized in the chart on the right. Saves you hours of reading. What you can see is there are four categories of policies that have been discussed in the literature and have been found to be effective. Financing firms always complain about financing. And there is something to it. That the, the evidence there is that fewer studies. It's just big emerging, but it looks like bigger access to finance does actually increase technology adoption. Second, market-based regulation and command and control regulation can be very effective at encouraging firms to adopt technologies. Now, command and control regulation are super effective. China has achieved a lot of its air pollution control through command and control regulations. It can be very effective, but there's a catch to this. It tends to have a heavy price. It tends to lead to collateral damage. It tends to have unintended con con consequences. The market-based regulation is just as effective and has less of these unintended con uh, consequences. So in particular, this market-based regulation are things like trading, cap and trade schemes. They've been used a lot in the US, but Gujarat is also experimenting with these. It's not just the US. There are some countries in Latin America that are experimenting with these. These are not just advanced economy things. These are schemes that work in emerging markets as well. It, Carbon tax also fits into that, but carbon tax is controversial. It's one way of changing the incentives so that price for carbon is no longer negative. It becomes at least neutral, if not positive. And then information campaigns we talked about. That was the, the first experiment I showed you. So there are measures that countries can take to improve energy te efficient technology adoption. That will lead to better productivity, because if energy if, uh, efficient technologies are adopted, you will pay less for energy and for the same output, no productivity gains. That translates into growth. But it has important collateral benefits. First is pollution control. That's how we started, no? Lahore and Peshawar, among the five most polluted cities in the world, even in the summer. You can see that the, the two, um, the two sectors that are influenced by our experiment, our discussion of firm level energy production, energy efficiency, power and industry, those two sectors in South Asia actually do account for about half of South Asia's polluting, the pollution emissions, the, the, the nasty 2.5 emissions that get stuck in your lungs and give you cancer. Yeah, so about half of that uh, pollution is actually coming for the industries that we're discussing here. The other benefit, and that may come as a surprise to many, this may not be the most intuitive, is that these firms that have implemented energy efficient technologies, what did they do with these efficiency gains? They invested them in jobs. That's what the chart on the right here shows you. It's a simple regression in our sample of firms that asks where were you in terms of energy efficiency Early on, when the sample started, this, is, this applies to just India, because it's very difficult to get a panel data set for firms. So India is the one, the ASI panel data set is like state of the art. This is what everyone uses. So we use that and check what happens to firms, what happens to employment generation, job creation of firms that had below efficiency, below median cuts in energy efficiency and above median cut in, cuts in energy efficiency. Those firms, that made faster gains in energy efficiency, those were the firms that created jobs. So it looks like the energy efficiency savings that they generated, they invested in people. That's what we're aiming for in the energy transition. This is the good case that we're aiming for in the energy transition. And that takes me to the last question, the labor market implications of the energy transition. It's those jobs that will be needed 
when the energy transition really gets underway. Because a lot of people are currently in pollution intensive jobs and as the energy transition gets underway, these people will be looking for jobs. You guys who are about to graduate, you'll also be looking for jobs. I have one piece of good news here. But let's start with the basic facts. The chart on the left takes labor force surveys for the countries where we could find them, reasonably recent, and just counts the number of people. The, the number of people in green jobs, the blue bars, and the number of people in pollution intensive jobs, the golden bars. You can see that for the region as a whole, about 9% of workers are in pollution intensive jobs. In every country, including Pakistan, every, well, almost every country, including in Pakistan, the number of people in pollution-intensive jobs is larger than the number of people in green jobs. Now, what's a green job? There is actually, this is a field that's still developing, but there is actually now beginning to emerge a definition of a green job. A green job is defined across the literature by now as a, an occupation that has some sort of green task attached. So that could be recycling, that could be renewable energy, that could also be a bike repair, that could be a car repair. It's got a range of activities. All of these things are considered green tasks in occupation. A pollution-intensive job is a job that is prevalent, very common or most common, in a polluting industry. And yes, that includes fossil fuels and mines and all these things, but it also includes, for example, garment workers. So it's, it's actually quite a broad... Uh, um, it's, it's actually not just a few narrow occupations, it's quite a broad definition. And you would be surprised that agriculture is actually not entirely green. Only 1% of jobs in agriculture are considered green. And okay, much fewer of them, point something percent of jobs are considered, considered pollution intensive. But the vast majority of jobs in agriculture are neither nor, they're just somewhere in between, they're neutral. Just like the vast majority of jobs in the economy, about 80% of the jobs in the, in the broader South Asian economy, are neither nor, they're just neutral. Uh, uh, there, there is a difference between green jobs and pollution intensive jobs. Green jobs tend to be much wider spread. Pollution intensive jobs tend to be more concentrated. Pollution intensive jobs tend to be concentrated manufacturing, the red bars here on the right. They also, oops, they, they, they're also concentrated among workers that have lower skills and are more informal. So that's what you see in the chart on the far side here, on the far left, right? We run a probate regression to test whether the, or to show you here in the chart on the right, that the probability of a person with a secondary or tertiary education of being in a, sorry, the, the probability that a person in a green job has a secondary or tertiary education is significantly above zero. Yeah? So basically, bottom line is the green jobs are the ones who are more likely to have tertiary and secondary education and less likely to have an informal job. The pollution intensive jo uh, uh, jobs are much more likely to have no edu secondary education, no tertiary education, and more likely to be informal. So pollution intensive jobs tend to be informal jobs with low skilled workers. Green jobs tend to be formal jobs with high skilled workers. So as you guys are going out into the labor market looking for jobs, those green jobs are very good, very attractive. They tend to be the higher skilled jobs, they tend to be the formal jobs. And they tend to have a wage premium. So on average, uh, green jobs pay about 30% more, but that's in part because the people in green jobs are better educated and more formal. But even once you control for that, green jobs offer a 7% wage premium in South Asia. That's the chart on the right here, the 7%. Yeah? It's a statistically significant wage premium over and above your qualifications in green jobs. They just pay better. That's not the case for pollution-intensive jobs. Pollution-intensive jobs pay less, on average 20-30% less, than normal jobs, other jobs, neutral jobs. But that is entirely due to the characteristics of the workers in them. They tend to be low-skilled jobs and they tend to be informal jobs, and that's what accounts for the wage difference. 
It's not a skill, it's not a, a wage discount in addition. Now, the workers who will be moving out of pollution-intensive industries, they will be exactly the vulnerable ones. They will be the, the low-skilled ones, they will be the informal ones. They will also be more concentrated. This, these two maps show you where the green jobs are. They show you the share of every district or provinces or regions or states uh, workers that is in green jobs on the left or in pollution intensive jobs on the right. There, there are eight districts that are very have eight subnational units that are very heavily reliant by, on pollution intensive jobs. Where pollution intensive jobs account for more than 10% of the workers. But there are only four districts that are very heavily reliant on green jobs. So there will be eight districts that will uh, around uh, subnational units around South Asia that will really struggle because they're so heavily focused on pollution-intensive region uh, activities. Now that is all status quo. That's in the past. What will the future bring? Of course, no one knows. Like Dr. Zaidi very clearly said, we, we don't really know what will come in the future, but. We can look at other examples of big structural breaks that happened elsewhere at another time and perhaps find some cautionary lessons in there. So the most obvious comparison that we could find with the, that has a large academic literature is resource booms and busts. Yeah, resource booms lead to regions expanding because there's been some new coal mine or some new uh, gold mine or some new resource discovered, and then they, the, the mine is empty and the region collapses. There's a bust. There is a big literature on this, many decades of experience, many countries that emerging markets, poor countries, rich countries, all sorts of countries where we can draw lessons from. So we've taken again that literature. Every study we could find, 40, 50 studies, and we've again extracted the main lessons from that. And here we even managed to run a meta-regression analysis. This is what these two charts show you. The chart on the left shows you what happens to booms, and the chart on the right shows you what happens to the busts that inevitably come. You can see that in the booms, employment goes up. Employment goes up significantly. Earnings actually don't go up, and the reason is that people migrate. They migrate to these regions. So this is what might happen to the regions that have a lot of potential for green energy. Big employment boom, thriving communities, but not necessarily increase in earnings because people will be moving to these communities. You will have a big pickup around services that support these green in industries. There's just a general flourishing of the local economy that comes with it. And then comes the bust. These flourishings of the local community tend to be temporary as long as the boom lasts, and then comes the bust. And the bust is not temporary. The bust is lasting. That's what the literature finds over and over again. It finds deserted communities. There is big outflow. Employment falls significantly. Earnings fall significantly and permanently, and that will hit generation after generation. The first generation loses a job. The ge second generation doesn't stay in school. These are lasting losses from these resource busts. And we see that in advanced economies, we see that in emerging markets. You, you've all, you may have heard uh, many stories, novels written about the coal busts in the UK and in the, the continental Europe and in the US. These are really difficult to manage busts. And this is what pollution intensive areas might be looking at if they don't take policy action now. The policy action to take that comes out of also the lesson from this literature review is actually not the obvious one. It's to help people adapt, to help people move, to help people vote with their feet. There are no jobs to be had. So one of the most effective policies is simply to help people move, move away from where there are no jobs. And the way that some countries, the ones who've managed, who've had the money, the ones who've had the fiscal resources, They've managed to build railings. They've managed to build roads to the next population center. So people could live at home but work elsewhere. They've managed to build education so people could find a job elsewhere. They've managed digital infrastructure so people could work remotely. So all these things that help people move. They've had social benefits that are portable so people can move and can still access schools, can still access hospitals, can still get social support when they move to a different place. 
So all these policies that really help people move and find more productive employment elsewhere, rather than being stuck in these contracting regions, those are really at a premium. And all of these policies require fiscal resources. They will require uh, well-funded government that directs its spending where it's most efficiently used. And with this, let me summarize. So the short-term outlook, the region is actually doing well compared to other regions, but not well compared to its own pre-pandemic path, not well compared to the government's goals either. And that's if nothing goes wrong. Lots of things can go wrong. Uh, in some countries, not in Pakistan, <laughs> Or in all countries in the region, private investment is very weak. But in some countries in the region, that is offset by pu strong public investment. Now, the, that will become a challenge to sustain because all countries in the region are very, uh, have fiscal challenges. And the two fiscal challenges that are really common across the region stand out, among other regions too, are high debt, low revenues. That is something that constrains the operation of government around, around uh, everything, in the, all the growth process in the region. There is one possible win-win in this global energy transition that countries, some countries might be able to leverage, hopefully South Asia can also leverage, is energy efficient technologies. This is a way to improve, improve productivity, to improve energy efficiency, and reduce global GHG emissions, but also to reduce pollution that is weighing on, on health around the region and to create jobs because it turns out that what firms do when they have energy savings they invest them in jobs at least in the countries where we have the data now the energy transition will have implications for labor markets and those will create challenges for some reasons especially the the, the reasons that the nine percent of workers who are engaged in pollution intensive tasks or in pollution intensive jobs in the region. They will be looking for new jobs and they will be exactly the ones who will find it difficult to find those jobs because they will be the ones that are low-skilled low in informal employment. Uh, there's more detail, well, there's a lot more detail in each of these uh, chapters, so I invite you to have a look at our report where we elaborate, including on the methodology, in a much greater detail. Thank you very much. Thank you.